του Πρινστον και της Ρούλης. Δεν θα πω περισσότερο να ευχαριστήσω τους συναδέλφους που έχουν κάνει τον κόπο να έρθουν, όλους εσάς. Δεν θα πω περισσότερα, ο άνθρωπος είναι οι ιδέες του. Θα ξέρω που ο κύριος Ιγγέρης είναι εδώ, νομίζω τις ιδέες που μπορεί να τις εκθέσει ο ίδιος. Πριν μου δώσω το λόγο, να θυμίσω ότι τη Δευτέρα υπάρχει η αναγόρυψη όπως επίτυμα δέντρα των Μαχάμιων στην Αθηνό, η ιστορία μου συγκεκριμένη. Σας παραδέχω στον τελευταίο μας το συγκεκριμένο. Προφυσίγερ. Thank you very much for that and welcome. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to be able to speak to you. So, um, what I want to do first is to tell you a little bit about my most recent work, uh, which relates to a book which was published only uh, last month called The Most Good You Can Do. And um, then after that, we're going to have some question and discussion. And in the question and discussion, I am happy for you to ask me not only about what I will be talking about at first, but also about any of my views that you might have read or discussed um, in your classes or come across in any other way. So, um, let me begin by uh, talking about uh, this most recent book. Now, thank you very much. So the, this book um, is, in a way, a continuation of work that I've been engaged in throughout my ethical career, my philosophical career. Um, and I think some of you may have come across uh, one of the first articles that I ever published back in 1972 called Famine, Affluence and Morality. And in that, in that article, um, I started by asking my readers to imagine that they were walking across a path that has in it a shallow pond. And uh, you imagine that you see in the pond a small child who is in danger of drowning. And there's nobody else in the park who is looking after the child, as far as you can see. There's only you and the child, and you could uh, easily save the child because you know that the pond is not deep, you just have to wade into the pond and you can pull the child out. <coughs> so that's because your first thought would be that what you ought to do is to save the child. But then imagine that you realize that you have this morning got dressed in your very best and most expensive clothes because uh, you're going somewhere important. And if you jump into this pond with these clothes, they will be ruined. And you will have to buy new clothes. Um, so there is some cost to you. It's not a huge cost, but there is some cost to you in saving the child. Now, um, what I then argue is that even though there is some cost to you in saving a child, and even though, uh, in, even though you are not responsible for the child being in trouble, in other words, you know, you've never seen this child before, and you have no relationship with the child, the child is a complete stranger. So, despite that, I think everybody would say that you ought to save the child, that you ought to jump into the pond even though you know that you're going to ruin your best clothes. Um, and if you did not do that, you would be really a bad person. You would have done something that you could not ethically defend. So, 
If we agree on that claim, that you ought to rescue the child, then what I, the next thing I argue is that our situation with regard to people in extreme poverty is analogous to that in at least the most morally important respects. So, with regard to people in extreme poverty, many children die because of preventable uh, causes that are related to their extreme poverty. Perhaps uh, they do not have safe drinking water, and so they get diarrhea. And when they get diarrhea, they cannot get any health care because there is no physician or even nurse in their area. And so they may die from diarrhea, or they may die from measles because they have not been immunized against measles. Or they uh, may die from malaria because they do not have bed nets to protect them from the mosquitoes. So, um, these are things which are preventable. Uh, it's not difficult. It's not difficult to uh, provide people with bed nets so that they don't get malaria, or to provide them with a simple treatment for diarrhea, so that if they do get diarrhea, they will not die from it. Um, so, uh, we can save the lives of strangers, and we can do so relatively inexpensively, maybe a little bit more than your clothing, but uh, relatively inexpensively we can save lives. And yet, a lot of people can't think that this gives rise to any obligations. Uh, we don't think badly of people who do not do anything to help people in extreme poverty. So, so that was the argument that I put uh, a long time ago, more than, more than 40 years ago. And uh, in it I argued that we ought to be doing a lot more than we are doing to help people in extreme poverty. Now, um, for many years that article was out there, people talked about it, it was quite uh, widely reprinted in uh, anthologies used in ethics classes, it was translated into a number of different languages, and some people certainly were influenced by it to actually do something about it, to uh, give to organizations that were helping people in extreme poverty. But um, it's only quite recently that uh, this movement has really grown and has become a uh, more significant force with not just uh, an academic aspect to it, but also an activist aspect to it. That is, um, groups of people, often students, but also sometimes people beyond the student years, who are thinking that this ought to be an important part of their life. And um, this movement is known as effective altruism. And uh, if you Google effective altruism now, you will get quite a lot of websites that talk about it or uh, discussing effective altruism. So I wrote the new book, uh, the, the Most Good You Can Do, in order to introduce this movement to a wider range of people and also to discuss some of the ethical issues that it raises. And what I would like to do now is to talk a little bit about uh, some of the values in this movement. So, if you, if you go to uh, Wikipedia and you put in effective altruism, you will find a definition which 
says something like this, um, effective altruism is a philosophy and a social movement which holds that we should try to do the most we can to improve the world and in doing so we should use reason and evidence to try to find out what is the best way to do the most good. And I think that is a, that's a good, very short definition of effective altruism. So there are these two elements to it. One is living altruistically, and the other is using reason and evidence to find out how best to do that, how to do the most good. And these two elements, at least historically, have often not gone together. So it's interesting that in the effective altruism movement, they are combined. Because if you think about altruism, about helping others, about charity, about benevolence, typically it is based more on an emotional appeal. It's an emotional response to the needs of others. And if you look at the way people give to charity, um, there's not usually a lot of reason and reflection in that. It's often much more impulsive. In fact, um, a survey in the United States of people who donate to charity show that 70% of them do no research at all about the charity to which they're donating. So perhaps somebody has uh, waved a tin under their nose and they put some money in that. Perhaps they got a leaflet which has some pictures of children in need and they gave money to that charity. Perhaps some friend mentioned the charity to them and they gave money for that reason. Um, but they did no research on it. And even the remaining 30% who did some research, the research is usually very superficial. Uh, it doesn't get into any serious evaluation of the impact that the organization has. Uh, so uh, that's the altruistic side of it. Um, and the effective altruism movement is, is saying, well, we do want to do things to help others. That should be an important part of everyone's life. But it's not good enough just to do it without looking for evidence that what you're doing is really going to be effective. And therefore, the Effective Altruism Movement has been trying to provide research and evidence on this topic. Because of course it realizes that not everybody has the time or skills to do the research themselves. Fortunately, as a result of the internet, it's very easy to look up the research that other people have done. And so there are websites, uh, there's a website called GiveWell, uh, givewell.org, which evaluates charities, uh, there's a website from an organization that I've been involved with called The Life You Can Save, and thelifeyoucansave.org will also recommend some charities. Um, and this is based on research into the impact and the cost effectiveness of the charities. And what that research has shown is that uh, there is a huge difference in the effectiveness of different charities. So that um, giving to a highly effective charity might giving, let's say, the same amount, whatever amount you have to give, um, you can give 100 euros to a charity. With one charity, it might do a small amount of good. In a different charity, it might do not just twice as much, 
or ten times as much, or even hundreds of times as much good as in the less effective charity. So obviously that means that it's very important if what you're interested in is the consequences of your actions, it's very important to actually do the research and assess the, the different channels. Now let me say a little bit about what we mean by improving the world, what kind of uh, values underlie this, because this is relevant also to the question of what is most effective here. The effective altruism movement holds that when we talk about improving the world, we really mean that in a fully universal sense. So you could say something, some people use the term global humanitarians. So we are concerned with well with improving the welfare of people wherever they might be. And uh, that will mean that we will direct our charity where we think it is going to do the most good, not necessarily only to our own local community which, depending on where you're living, might do less good for the amount that you're able to contribute than some other place. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Secondly, if you ask, well, what values are we talking about when we talk about doing the most good, the effective altruism movement focuses really mainly on uh, what we might refer to welfare or well-being. So it is broadly in line with the values that uh, utilitarians like myself hold. That is, it thinks that if you reduce the amount of suffering in the world, you make the world a better place. If you increase the amount of happiness or well-being in the world, you make the world a better place. If you allow people to continue to live when they might otherwise have died, at least if their quality of life is positive, then you are improving the world. So things like reducing suffering, reducing premature death are crucial for this idea of improving the world. Now, of course, but these are not the only values that people hold. And um, one might say, well, is this only a movement for utilitarians who think that well-being is the only thing that matters? Um, I would say no, it's not, but um, the welfare values that I've just mentioned are the common core around which this movement is concerned. So I would say everybody in the movement would agree that reducing suffering is a good thing, that increasing happiness is a good thing. Does everybody agree that things like fairness or justice or equality are also good things? Well, probably not everyone, or at least not everyone would agree that these are intrinsically good things. Perhaps most people would say, yes, equality and fairness and justice are good because in a society that instantiates equality and justice and fairness, then you are likely to have less suffering and more welfare. But they are good instrumentally not intrinsic. Whereas there might be other people who would also consider themselves to be effective altruists who would say, no, I think these things are good intrinsically. Um, and I think that you know, that's not a question that gets resolved, whether these values are good intrinsically or instrumentally. Um, I mean, it's a question obviously that philosophers can and should discuss, but in terms of the more activist, more practical movement, 
I think, effective outcomes can say, well, let's work for the things that we agree on as important, like reducing suffering and increasing happiness. And if some of you want to work on increasing equality as well, or justice or fairness, that's fine, but not everybody has to do that. Now, another question is, uh, whose suffering are we talking about? I've already said this is global, so we are not talking only about suffering in our local community, we are talking about this worldwide. But generally speaking, effective altruists would agree that the suffering of any being capable of suffering matters. So this is not only about human suffering, but that if we can reduce the suffering of non-human animals, if we can give them better lives, that is also a good thing to do. I think that some effective altruists would say that the suffering of animals counts equally with similar suffering of humans. That's a position that I would take, that I've defended in many of my works. But not all effective altruists would agree with that. They would agree that it matters, but they might say human suffering is different in quality in some important way and matters more. So again, that's, that's a question which there would be differences of opinion on within the effective altruist movement. And so some of the people in this movement would focus on reducing the suffering of animals. Um, probably more of them would focus on reducing the suffering of human beings. Um, and, but the, the movement is broad enough to embrace both of them. Finally, in, in talking about values, um, I should emphasize that because what we're talking about is ways of improving the world, there are many different sorts of things that we could do, some of which will have a very high probability of achieving their aims and others of which will have a much lower probability of achieving their aims. Now, obviously, if the aims are the same, it would make sense to choose the ones that have the higher probability of achieving their aims. But very often the aims are not the same. So, to consider some quite extreme differences, one thing that you could do, that an effective charity would do, would be to distribute bed nets against mosquitoes to people who are living in areas where there are a lot of mosquitoes and where most people can't afford to buy bed nets. So there are organizations that do this and they undoubtedly save lives and stop people getting sick from malaria. So if you give to an effective organization that is doing this, then you are with a very high degree of probability, nothing of course is absolutely certain, but with a very high degree of probability, you will be preventing people getting seriously ill and you will be preventing some people from dying. But if you are not a billionaire, obviously there's only a limited number of people that you can help. On the other hand, suppose you say, um, I think that the world's economic trade system is unfair to developing countries and perpetuates poverty. Uh, and there's, I think, a lot of truth in that and there are many things that could be done. For example, the agricultural subsidies that are provided by the European Union and the United States have a harmful effect on very poor people in developing countries because um, 
they lower the price of agricultural products on world markets. And um, that makes it harder for small and impoverished farmers to sell their products on the world markets, so it reduces their income. So essentially what's happening is that taxpayers in relatively affluent countries are helping their farmers, who are also by world standards relatively affluent, and um, they are harming much poorer farmers uh, in developing countries. So it would be a good thing if those agricultural subsidies could be stopped. But suppose that you set out to do that. Suppose that you, instead of donating to the organization that is distributing bed nets against malaria, you support political activities to reduce agricultural subsidies that are harmful to small farmers in developing countries. How likely is it that you will succeed? And in particular, how likely is it that your personal contribution will make any difference to the chances of success of that political campaign? I'd say the chances are very, very small that you will be able to make any difference to the success of that campaign. But, if the campaign does succeed, it will help millions, tens of millions at least, possibly hundreds of millions, of very poor people in developing countries. So, um, depending on really how small the chances of success are, that might be something that is worth doing. The concept that I'm talking about here is known as expected value. So what effective altruists want to do is the action that has the highest expected value. And expected value is the value you achieve if you succeed divided by the probability of success. So if your probability of success is only one in a hundred, but success will save a thousand lives, you have an expected value of 10. And if you have a different project which has a 90% chance of saving 10 lives, you have an expected value of nine. So it might be justified to choose the project that has the lower chance of success depending on the size of the payoff. Okay, so that's the way effective altruists think about um, what they ought to be doing. Now, if you think about this for a moment, you'll see that it is going to change philanthropy. It is going to change our ideas of altruism in uh, some interesting ways. <clears throat> One of them is that it's suggesting that there is a kind of a calculus which would lead us to decide what we ought to do in terms of trying to improve the world. And it actually suggests that there is something like an objective answer to that question. Now, we may not always know, we may not be able to calculate what the objective answer is, because of course, as in the example I gave you, we can't really calculate the probabilities of success of a campaign to reduce agricultural substance in town. But nevertheless, it's saying, look, there are some things which, if we knew all the facts, we would be able to see we're better to do than others. And very often, if we do know enough about those facts, uh, and for example, I think those facts mean that if we are concerned to help human beings, it's generally better to give to organizations trying to help the very poorest human beings rather than those who are not so poor. Um, let me give you one example, uh, which uh, I've used in uh, other talks. Um, 
Um, so, one of the charities that exists in many affluent societies, uh, probably exists here in Greece, I don't really know, um, but certainly exists in the United States or the United Kingdom or Australia, are uh, uh, charities that will train guide dogs for people who are blind. So, um, a well-trained dog can be of assistance to somebody who is blind in getting around in their daily life. And that obviously is a good thing. But it's also quite an expensive thing. Uh, again, I have no idea what the figures are in Greece, but in the United States, it costs at least $40,000 to train a guide dog um, and to also provide the training to the blind person how to relate to the dog um, so that you have, they can work as a team. So $40,000 so that one blind person can have a better life, can get around more easily. Now let's consider what happens in developing countries. In developing countries, Many people develop uh, cataracts as they get older. Right? Now, of course, people develop cataracts in affluent countries as well. But in affluent countries that have any kind of provision for healthcare, and really all the affluent nations do have some sort of national healthcare scheme, even the United States, although it's got more gaps in it than uh, healthcare schemes in. European nations, um, even in the United States, uh, really nobody is blind because they have cataracts. They can get the cataracts removed. It's quite a simple operation. Um, either it's covered by the health insurance that you have, or you can get it free on the National Health Service. But in poor countries that have no National Health Service, where there are a lot of people who are in extreme poverty, there are millions of people who are blind because they have cataracts, which they have not had been able to have removed. So, one thing that some charities do is that they train doctors to perform cataract operations in developing countries. They provide a mobile clinic where the operation can safely be performed. Um, and they therefore travel to rural areas and invite people who have cataracts to come and have the cataracts removed. That costs, I mean the estimates vary a little bit, but some of these charities say that it costs $25 per cataract removed. Some people say that's too low, maybe it costs $50, maybe it costs $100. But even if at the higher end, let's say it costs $100, then you can see that you have the choice between contributing to a charity that will train guide dogs for people who are blind, and where if, you, if the charity accumulates $40,000, one blind person will get a guide dog, or contributing to charities that are removing cataracts from people who are blind, where if the charity can raise $40,000, it will be able to restore sight to at least 400 people. Now, I think anybody would agree that it's better to have your sight restored than to remain blind but be given a guide dog. So, it's at least 400 times as cost effective to give to the charity that removes cataracts as it is to give to the charity that trains guidelines. Um, so effective altruists would say, we ought not to give to charities that train guidelines. That will sound harsh to some people. They will say, oh, here are these people in my community who are now not going to get guidelines because these people are not going to support those charities. But, they are saying the reason why we should not support these charities is because our money can do more good elsewhere. And that does seem to me to be a sound argument. 
We ought to focus on doing the most good we can with whatever resources we have that we are prepared to donate to helping other people, to making the world the best possible place. So this is where the universalism that I talked about before starts to really have a practical impact. And some people want to resist that conclusion. Some people will say, for example, um, I have special obligations to people in my own community. Now, I think that it's true that we may be more emotionally moved by the situations of people that we see. We may actually come across blind people in our own community who have difficulty getting around because they do not have guard dogs. But I would argue that the effective government's position is correct here, that um, we should be impartial in that respect between people in our own community and people in distant communities. Just as in the case of the drowning child in the pond, if we're prepared to incur a cost to save that baby in the pond, we should be prepared to do the same to people who are far away from us. So I think if we're prepared to help people who are blind, we ought to try to help more people rather than fewer people. We ought not to care that much about whether the people we're helping are close to us or far away. Some people will of course say, well, why can't we do both? That's a very common response to this argument. But again, I don't think it's a response that is really um, one that can be defended. Because all of us have a finite amount of resources. Even if we're prepared to give away almost everything we have, it's still going to be finite. So, you know, generally most of us will say, well, if I keep enough for me to live on or be reasonably comfortable, that means I can give away a certain amount, right, depending what it might be that you have. I might be able to give away uh, 100 euros or 1,000 euros or 10,000 euros or if I'm very comfortably off, 100,000 euros a year, but it's limited. So even if I can give away 100,000 euros a year, um, if I give half of that to train guide dogs and half of it to remove cataracts, I'm not going to be doing as much good with it as if I gave the whole 100,000 to remove cataracts. Because the charities that are trying to do that cannot, still cannot reach all of the people who have cataracts that could be easily removed. I hope that one day this situation will no longer exist. And that is certainly what people in effective altruism hope. They hope that eventually everybody who has a cataract will be able to get it removed. Possibly there will be some exceptions of people who live in very remote, difficult to reach areas, but then it would also be more expensive to help them. So if we get to the point where everybody or almost everybody who is blind because they have cataracts can have those cataracts removed, then we will get to the point where we can say, okay, we've done that. Now, what offers the next best value for money? And then we can do that, whatever that is. And eventually we'll get to the point where we might say, okay, now there are some people who are blind and we can't restore their sight because it's not because of cataracts or anything simple like that. But we can give them guide dogs. And at that point, we'll say, fine, this now becomes the most cost-effective thing we can do. But until we reach that point, I would argue we ought to be looking for the most cost-effective things. Okay, so far I've been comparing things to the rather similar helping people who are blind in different ways. And as I said, I think we can all agree that to restore sight to somebody is better than giving them a guide dog. 
even the people who do have guard dogs, if you said, look, we could restore your site, would you like us to do that? But if we do, that of course will take your guide dog away, you won't need the guide dog anymore. Overwhelmingly, the other day would say, yes, restore my site, I'll be better off. So we have that kind of agreement that it's better to be able to see and to be blind with a guide dog. Suppose we try to compare very different sorts of charities. Um, another thing that many people donate to is to the arts, to uh, museums or art galleries, to uh, concert halls, to uh, opera houses and, and so on. Especially in the United States, there was a big tradition of uh, philanthropy for such activities, but it certainly also exists in Europe as well. Then people might say, well, what do effective altruists say about this? And generally speaking, I think effective altruists would also say, this is not as effective in improving the world as um, helping to restore sight or saving life or giving people who are extremely poor uh, some more some more uh, income, even just a, a cash grant so that they can feed their families better and uh, carry out various other improvements in their lives. Those things are more important and offer better value than um, donating to an art museum or a concert hall or something of that sort. But the question still comes up, how do we actually reach that judgment? Can we really compare these very different things? This becomes more difficult, I think. Uh, but I do think that it's possible to make some comparisons. And in, in the book, uh, The Most Good You Can Do, um, I talk about a way, a sort of hypothetical example, which perhaps gives us a sense of how to value these sorts of things. So, I imagine that you are a wealthy person able to give to charity and you are approached by two charities. Let's say one of them is the charity that I've already been talking about that removes cataracts in people who are blind. And the other charity is uh, one of the famous art galleries because I was writing at least largely for an American readership, I imagine that it was the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which is in fact planning to build a new wing at the moment. And the new wing is going to cost several hundred million dollars. So I suppose that you were asked to donate to this. How could you try to decide which was the better charity to donate to? And what I suggest is something like this. Um, you imagine that the, the, the new wing of the gallery gets built at whatever the cost might be. And uh, visitors to the gallery are asked if they want to go and visit the new wing. And of course, if you just ask them like that, they would say, you know, yes, why not? Um, let's see the, the new wing. But suppose you tell them, this is a kind of, you know, philosophers like these kind of imaginary stories because they're a way of testing the way you think. Suppose you tell them, look, there is one thing I need to tell you before you visit the new wing. There is a powerful demon who, because he is rather capricious, every now and again strikes somebody blind who has been to go to visit the new wing. It doesn't make anybody blind unless they visit the new wing. If you just go to the rest of the museum, don't worry, the demon will not affect you. But if you go to the new wing, there's, let's say, a one in a thousand chance that the demon will make you blind. Would you still like to go to the new wing? Well, I imagine that most people would say, thank you very much, but I'll stick with the old part of the gallery. It's not worth a one in a thousand chance of going blind to see the new wing. 
Now, you might try that with different sorts of odds, obviously. You might say, suppose it's not a one in a thousand chance, but a one in 10,000 chance. Would you do it? Maybe some people would now say yes, but my guess is probably a lot of people would still say no. And you know, if you say it's a one in a hundred million chance, maybe more people would say yes, because they would discount such a small chance. Anyway, whatever the figure is, whatever the figure is that most people would accept, you know, at some point, there would be a figure where I guess people would say, oh, okay, you could, doesn't, you know, that's, that's about the level of two. Whatever that figure is, you can use that as a way of getting a, their own evaluation of how bad it is to go blind as compared to how good it is to see the new wing of the gallery. And once you've done that, and you know the cost of the new wing of the gallery, then the rest of it is fairly simple mathematics. You can say, you know, let's say the, what you have to know I guess also is how many people are going to visit the wing of the gallery, but you have to say, well, um, people value a visit to the gallery at less than, let's say, one hundred thousandth of the negative value of going blind. Um, and then you can calculate the number of visitors who will go to the gallery compared to the costs of building the new gallery as compared to the costs of restoring somebody's site and you can work out whether the gallery is or is not good value and in the book I did some very rough calculations you know how long will the wing be there for how much will it cost how many visitors are likely to visit it what kind of a figure would people be prepared to accept in terms of a risk of going blind compared to going to the gallery? Um, and my result of my calculation is that uh, it's still, it's much better value to prevent people going blind than to donate to supporting the gallery. Now, you can, you can look at the figures and see whether you agree with that, but um, I think it does support probably what most people would think Anyway, um, although we value the arts, we don't value them so highly that we would take even small risks of becoming blind in order to have that additional aesthetic experience. Now, some people will then say, okay, so what you're saying really is that we should just let the arts collapse because all of our financial resources uh, that we have to spare should go to helping people in extreme poverty. Um, I don't think that is quite the implication of my view, although I admit that it goes some direction, some, some distance in that direction. Clearly I think that things that are part of the heritage, the artistic heritage, of our species should be preserved. Obviously you have a great number of that. Those sorts of priceless heritages are here, uh, here in Greece. So I think they should be preserved because hopefully they will, if they're preserved, last for many centuries or millennia and people will appreciate them and benefit them for a very long time. But if we're talking about, not about preserving them from destruction, but about providing better exhibition spaces for them so people can enjoy them more, or providing better concert halls or opera houses so that people can enjoy listening to music better. Um, those are much more short-term sorts of benefits. And I do think that we are not justified in spending our resources on those kinds of benefits. Um, I think that this is not going to mean the end of art or the end of music, because if you look at art and music in a historical sense and also in a cross-cultural sense, you see that there is a more or less universal urge to produce art and music. And people do that even if they are not getting paid for it in any way. 
They do it even if they know it will not be preserved for long periods. So we are still going to have artistic expression. That doesn't really require large sums of money. But what we will have, of course, is a rather different cultural attitude to spending large sums of money on the arts. And I actually don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that the amount of money spent on the arts really has a corrupting influence. Um, if you've been looking at news about the arts just in the last few weeks, you will have seen that, again, new records have been broken for the prices reached by various artworks. So Picasso was sold in New York for $179 million. Um, and not even one of the most famous Picassos, though, uh, a, a good Picasso, if you like. Um, you know, I think that kind of amount of money is, is ridiculous, really. I think it's absurd to say that uh, the value of having this particular work of art uh, can compare with the other things that that sort of money could do. Okay. I do want to give you plenty of time for questions, so I'm just going to say one more thing about this topic and then I will stop. People will say, uh, so why should we be altruists at all? Right? The effective altruism movement is a movement of people who are, is a movement of people who are um, interested in, in being altruistic and spending a part of their lives in doing something that is uh, significantly altruistic. What is motivating them to do this? I think that uh, there are a lot of different motivations. Some people are simply you know, can directly appreciate that if they can help somebody at a relatively small cost to themselves, that's the right thing to do. And they want to do that. For other people, I think they actually feel that this kind of activity adds a purpose and a meaning to their life um, that they would not otherwise have. The, the kind of life that the consumer of society encourages us to have is one in which we judge our success by our acquisition of material goods. So we judge our success by how much we earn, by our status in some corporation or institution, and therefore by how expensive a house or apartment we can own, what kind of car we drive, what kind of places we take vacations to. Um, and there's, there's good evidence that this is not really a route to a happy or fulfilling life. Um, and this is, this is a fairly ancient view that I'm putting forward, that there is this paradox of hedonism, that if you focus directly on achieving pleasure, you're less likely to find it than if you focus on something else. Um, but this ancient wisdom has actually now been supported by quite a lot of psychological research that does show that people who are generous, who donate to charity, who help others, have happier lives, that they are more satisfied with their lives. And it also shows, I believe, that this is not just a correlation. It's not just that happier people give more, but that the causation actually does lead from the giving to the happiness and the satisfaction. <coughs> we can see this in uh, neuroimaging studies where we're taking real-time images of people's brains and we give them some amount of money and we ask them to decide what to do with it between a variety of options that include buying something for themselves and um, doing something for others. And we can see that those that decide to direct the money towards doing something for others actually have more activity in the parts of their brain that are associated with things that we enjoy. The, the same parts of the brain that light up when we have delicious food or great sex also 
are active when people decide to help others. And we also have research which we show that if we give people at the beginning of the day some money and randomly select half of them to say, go and buy yourself something nice, and randomly select the other half of them to say, use this money to do something good for someone else, and then they come back to us at the, back of, at the end of the day and we ask them to fill out a questionnaire telling us what their mood is like, how much they enjoyed their day, how satisfied they are with their life, and a few things like that. Those whom we told to do something for others actually have a more positive evaluation, even of that single day, than those who spent the money on themselves. So, there's a sense in which, having introduced the idea of effective altruism, I might now say it's not really altruism at all. It's not really altruism in the sense of making a sacrifice to your own welfare. It is altruism in that your activities are directed to others. But it turns out, I think, that in this broader, more enlightened sense of self-interest, it benefits you as well. Okay, so we've gone past 12 o'clock. Um, but we still have at least, I think, 50 minutes or so for questions and discussion. And I'll stop talking at that point and I'll invite your questions. As I said at the beginning, but a lot of you have come in since the beginning, um, there don't have to be questions on what I've just been talking about. I'm very happy to discuss that. Uh, and let me also mention, for the benefit of those who weren't here at the beginning, what I've been talking about is a kind of summary of my most recent book which was published last month and is called The Most Good You Can Do. So if you want to get a fuller account of what I've been talking about, um, you can order a copy of The Most Good You Can Do and you get the full account. Okay, who would like to ask a question? So, 
if, if we really try very hard to measure something to find what the best for everyone or for us at least uh, maybe we just go back to the case we, we regret to having other value judgments so my final question is since it's almost impossible to uh, be consistent with the utilitarianist by having means to measure things exactly and in the end you have to rely on your intuition is utilitarianism a regression or a qualification maybe to just refine the model of your intuition in? Okay, um, I hope people could hear the question um, which focuses on the difficulties of measuring utility and then asks whether, given those difficulties, utilitarianism is, in the end, a refined form of intuitionism. I think if you ask that question simply at the level of utility, as you did, you said utility you know, goes back to the, the base of it, then it's really hard to give an answer because different let, let, me, let me say, I would, I would use the term consequentialism for the view that the right action is the action that has the best consequences. And I use utilitarianism for a narrower view that the right action is the action that has the best consequences in the sense of promoting the greatest overall welfare. Now, welfare itself can be understood in different ways, but the difference between consequentialism and utilitarianism on this view is that consequentialists might have an even wider view of what is the best consequences. So they might include, for example, things like knowledge or freedom or autonomy or even respect for human rights. And if you're a consequentialist and you include all those things, then I'm inclined to agree with you that uh, you cannot compare or measure these very different things against each other. That is, you cannot compare their ultimate utility. And what you end up with is something rather like a refined form of intuitionism. I think you put that very well. But that's not my position. Uh, I am, in this sense, not just a consequentialist, because that's the broader view, but also a utilitarian. And I think the consequences we should focus on are the consequences for welfare. Now, what do we understand by welfare? Um, in my view, there's two main alternative accounts, and one of them which I have held for most of my career is the preference satisfaction view of welfare. That is, that somebody, welfare is at their highest when all of their preferences are satisfied. And the alternative, the major alternative, has always been the classical hedonistic view of Bentham and Mill and Sidgwick that um, welfare really means the greatest possible surplus of happiness over suffering or misery. So, in my most, well, not quite my most recent work anymore, as I said, the most work you can do is my most recent book, but the book before that that I published is a co-authored book with uh, Dr. Katarzyna de Lazari Radek um, called The Point of View of the Universe, which is a phrase from Henry Sidgwick, the 19th century utilitarian. And in that, uh, we defend hedonism rather than preference utilitarianism. Uh, and I, I must admit, I do this somewhat tentatively, having defended preference utilitarianism for so long, but I do now see more problems with it than I did before, and therefore may be readier to at least propose that hedonism might be a better alternative. If 
we were to say that we hold a utilitarian view in one of those senses, and perhaps even now more narrowly if we say we are defending hedonistic utilitarianism, then I don't think that utilitarianism could be seen as um, just a refined form of intuition. Uh, because I think, although it's still very difficult to measure what makes people happier or produces the greatest amount of net happiness, uh, and certainly it's difficult when you include animals, as you should, to compare their happiness and suffering with those of humans, um, I think that you can get some reasonably rough ideas in many situations. In fact, I think some of the things I was talking about today are doing just that, in comparison of the experiences of people going to the art gallery with people whose sight has been restored. Um, so I think that you can get some conclusions. I would say you get some definite conclusions of some actions being right or wrong, and others that are more iffy, more problematic as to how to know what to do. But I think you get enough strong conclusions for it to be clear that this is not just a cover for some form of intuition, that the, the theory leads you to some definite conclusions, and even if they're contrary to your intuitions, as I think some of them definitely are contrary to most people's intuitions, you should stick to the theory rather than the intuition. Okay, let's take another question. Anyone else over here in the side of the room? As, as I was uh, listening to, to your speech, I kept thinking it's, it's very close to the Christian message or the religious message. Which is the difference between, because I have the impression you are in favor of the way of living, which is the way of living approved or recommended by the main religions. Which is, which is the difference between your position? Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting point, and, and obviously some, some other aspects of my ethics are nothing like those of the Christian or other religious teachings. But in this particular respect uh, of altruism, and perhaps particularly because of my focus on the poor, which does seem to me to be the most effective way of giving, at least as far as giving to help humans is concerned, um, that fits quite well with uh, Christian teachings um, and with some other religious teachings as well, but I would say the emphasis on helping the poor is actually stronger in the Christian Gospels than it is in most other religious texts. Um, Oh, <laughs> oh,